Hello, I have decided to be kind and provide you with a video about the second lesson of the topic in history about France and Britain in mid-19th century Europe. So that's a lesson about economic and social changes during the first industrialization. And its uh, first slide is illustrated by one of the very famous paintings of British painter William Turner, who in the middle uh, of the 19th century um, um, illustrated with the, a new technique and a new way of seeing and depicting things uh, the fast changes that were happening in his country and in fact we can say that the changes in the landscape were really uh, connected to the changes in the economy of Britain. So as an introduction I think it's important to say a few words about uh, debate among uh, historians, uh, which uh, is about the expression we should use to refer to these uh, important changes that took place in the 19th century in Western Europe and in the USA, which some call industrialization, mostly the French historians, and others still use the expression industrial revolution which uh, was in fact invented uh, long ago. Um, let's define first of all what industri industrialization means. It's uh, a period of major economic and social changes due to significant improvement in the manufacturing industry. But I insist on that. When we talk about industrialization, we do not only talk about the change in techniques in the manufacturing, we really talk about all the consequences on the general economy and on society which are connected to this evolution. So French historians have used this term for a, a, a long time, but f for the last 30 years, I would say, um, there's been some criticisms about um, something that could sound clumsy in the term industrial revolution. Um, because uh, I think because also in France we like to uh, um, reserve the term revolution to political um, topics and also due to the fact that the, the changes linked to industrialization did not happen from one day to the next which is uh, what we mostly view when we figure out the idea of revolution so that for these reasons uh, uh, the, the term revolution should be avoided and it's a fact that English speaking historians still largely use the term industrial revolution and I believe this is due to two facts uh, I will illustrate these facts with a couple of graphs so this first bar chart is uh, a good old document from a French textbook, but I think it's really relevant. It shows you the changes in the labor force structure of four countries that can be considered as um, the, the four main countries that experienced industrialization before all the other countries. Uh, the, the four main economic powers in the world throughout the 19th and, and 20th century, at least first part of the 20th century, uh, in the Western world. What we can see that in these four countries the trend was the same. It's a trend that um, uh, consisted of a shift from a traditional economy where farming was the main sector of the economy, which is what had existed for centuries and centuries since the beginning of uh, the creation of human economies. So a shift from traditional economy to modern post-industrial actually economy. Today we are at the post-industrial level, which basically means that industrialization has happened. 
and uh, an economy nowadays where uh, jobs in services largely dominate. Well, if the trend was the same for these four countries, clearly by 1850, the middle of the 19th century, the United Kingdom was far more advanced than any other countries. And in fact, the United Kingdom was the country where industrialization started the first and clearly, obviously, it happened not only earlier but faster than in France, Germany or the USA. And it's, be be it's probably because of these reasons, this first reason at least that the British still like the, the phrase industrial revolution Maybe because in their country it was indeed almost as fast as a revolution and it changed a lot of things and it made the UK the most advanced and economically powerful country of the 19th century. It turned it into the first mostly urban country ever, so the, the most modern countries of all. And one last remark about this graph on the other hand, France's evolution was particularly slow. In fact, if you now look at uh, the, the graph of France in 1880, you will see that France was the, the country in Europe, at least, where uh, the proportion of farmers was still the most important. So industrialization was particularly fast in the UK and rather slow in France. The second reason why the, I think the British still have a point in using the phrase industrial revolution is that if we take some distance to really have a look at the, the bigger picture, which means have a, a wide look over history, well, you can see that indeed the changes that took place uh, in the 19th century were indeed almost as sudden as a revolution if we really look at man's history. This is a graph about real GDP per capita. It means that we are mostly studying the standards of living of the people. Okay. And uh, the graph starts in the year 1000, uh, common era, so in the Middle Ages. And you can see that for most of the centuries of the, of the previous millennium, well, GDP per capita in, in most countries of the world was stagnating only marked by a certain uh, increase after the 16th century. And this is what happened in the 19th century and after. So most of the incredible growth of the economies of the world took place in the 20th in real number. But the takeoff took place in the 19th century, okay? And, and that takeoff was remarkable by the fact that nothing like this had ever happened before. So what we are studying when we are studying economic and social changes in the mid 19th century is really maybe the most important topic when you study the history of mankind. Now, it's a fact that the way things happened uh, reveals that two characteristics played a great role in this economic takeoff, the existence of capitalism and the invention of the steam engine. So, first of all, let's recap a little bit about this concept of capitalism. It's a bit abstract, so uh, it's not easy. And again, I would like to, to say that um, you, you were born 
You were all born in a world where capitalism was overwhelmingly dominant and unchallenged. So it it's a bit like in the film Matrix. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but in Matrix, the characters, the humans, live in a virtual uh, environment and they are not aware of that because it's always been like that. Well, in a way, with capitalism, it's the same. Uh, we live in a world where capitalism is, is more than common. It is our structure. Maybe it will change, but from the, for the moment, it's our structure. In the 19th century, this economic structure was only emerging. And the country where it was emerging uh, the most clearly was clearly Britain. Why Britain? Well, it's, it's largely due to the, the political context. And here um, I must say that the fact that Britain was the European country where the notion of freedom of speech was uh, the most respected in any other country. Uh, we've seen that despite the French Revolution, in France, the circulation of ideas uh, could be limited, for example, under the regime of Napoleon, where there was some, some censorship, then with the restoration, it was the same. So I think that the fact that ideas circulated well in Britain is maybe one of the reasons why many innovations, both in uh, economic thinking and technological uh, engineering, uh, developed the best. Anyway, the ideas of liberal capitalism, so a capitalist economy based on liberty of action, was largely um, conceived by uh, a Scottish economist named Adam Smith, who promoted some very essential ideas for this economic system that for him the free market was the best way to organize an economy. It, in those days, this idea marked um, a turning point after centuries of uh, economic organization, notably during and after the Middle Ages, where um, uh, all economic actors did not have the same freedom. Okay. So um, that was quite a new idea, actually, an idea that did not benefit equally to every social classes. In fact, it mostly, uh, it mostly benefited to the bourgeoisie. But uh, it was quite a modern idea indeed. And uh, the reason why Adam Smith uh, praised the free market is because he believed, quote, that a fair competition between economic actors would result in fair prices, as prices result from the balance between supply and demand. So basically, he believed that if uh, almost everything was free in the economy, it was uh, for the, the profit of everyone. It was, uh, it was really a, a thinking that was quite idealistic. Okay, He really believed there was maybe something magical in, in the, the idea of free market. Even though, I would like to add that uh, Adam Smith was probably uh, less idealistic than one might say, because he also knew that this idea of free market should have limits. I, I would say like any liberty, any, any limits, uh, any liberty should have limits actually, otherwise it can't work. The, the liberties destroy each other. So the market must have limits. Some services can only be funded by a government, for example, uh, cleaning the streets. Nobody can make money out of that, really. But if it's not done, then it's no good for the society and the economy. That's an example. And some laws are, are vital to a fair competition. Uh, for example, the ban on monopolies. A monopoly is when you have one company that totally controls the sector. I don't know, think about uh, Facebook for social media, for example. They are almost in a state of, uh, of monopoly. Uh, well, Adam Smith believed that if, if one company dominates uh, 
one sector, then there is no competition. And so the idea of um, competition leading to a fair system uh, can't work. Uh, anyway, uh, I think I s changed the slide a, a bit too fast, but uh, don't forget that the, the uh, alongside freedom, capitalism is based on the idea that there should be a private ownership of the means of production and that the search for profit is not only good, the search for profit is what fuels the economic development. And, uh, and in fact, uh, the political system in Britain uh, led to this situation that because, because power was uh, shared by bourgeoisie and nobility, which was the result of the revolutions of the 17th century that were studied in second, uh, well, there was actually no obstacle to uh, the setting up of such a, what we can call such a business-friendly environment in Britain. Uh, as, for example, there was no more legal privileges for the nobility compared to the bourgeoisie. So that, that was the, 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 the environment in terms of law and, uh, and, and, and intellectual views. But what really changed Britain forever was the fact that technology now permitted a, a much huger accumulation of capital and a much greater productivity. So that's what I call the technological upheaval. To illustrate that part, I would like to show you another very beautiful painting by Turner. As you can see, it dates back really to the period that we are studying, 1839 here. And it's called the Fighting Temeraire. And actually, the Fighting Temeraire is the name of the old wide ship that you can see uh, on the left. Well, the story behind this painting is that this old white ship is now uh, damaged, it's too old, and it's being pulled by a small, modern, black uh, steamship, so working with modern technology, and it's, it's, well, sailing back to the harbor, and uh, she will die because, uh, yes, we, we say she for, for boats, actually, in English. That's, I would say, uh, a pretty interesting symbol of uh, this transition between an old world, an old economy, and a new world, and a new economy now based on the modern industry. And so at the, at the root of this uh, change, you have this uh, incredibly influential invention which actually turned into an innovation and that's the steam engine. So innovation is uh, when an invention is actually exploited in, uh, in the economy. Um, just for the specification of this, uh, this definition. And so uh, the steam engine is in fact a, a technique that was developed and improved by several inventors, several engineers. But the most important of them, I was told, and uh, definitely the most famous of these names, is the name of James Watt, who in the second part of the 18th century, so the century before, um, designed this machine whose principle is basically to create a vertical movement thanks to a uh, the the oven and the the heat turning water into steam thanks to this steam uh, uh, an up and down movement uh, is created and uh, this vertical movement is transformed into a circular movement so a wheel can be uh, set into action and thanks to coal, well, the ability to, to create heat uh, was really um, accelerated and increased. And as coal was massively present in some areas of Britain, like the north of England, the south of Wales, and also in Scotland, well, it um, 
really all the conditions were present for, for this innovation to take off. And indeed the steam engine had several uh, s sectors of implementation which were very interesting for Britain. So probably, um, well, the industry for which uh, Britain got a real leadership with, with great influence on its um, uh, international influence was the textile industry. Uh, the gains of productivity, so of, of efficiency to produce, were absolutely astonishing in spinning, which means creating threads. Uh, the productivity was multiplied by 500. In weaving, which means creating cloth, it was multiplied by 40. And so Britain was, throughout the 19th century, the main exporter of um, uh, cloth and garment. As you know, this has totally changed now. The other sector where the steam engine was uh, very well um, uh, exploited was the iron and steel industry, the creation of, of metal, and in particular this new metal called iron, which is so symbolic of the 19th century. We may think of some famous bridges and uh, also, even though it's a French example, to the Eiffel Tower, which is really uh, a symbol of this age of iron. And the last but extremely, extremely important um, implementation of the steam engine was the railway uh, transport system. Uh, as you can see on this illustration, even if it's a French illustration, uh, during the 19th century there was a kind of cohabitation between the transport systems of, uh, of old, like the car pulled by horses here, and the um, steam train. And uh, clearly the trend throughout the 19th century was that of an uh, uh, enlargement and increase of the network of trains in Britain, and also in France, we'll see that. But Britain was pretty soon the most densely interconnected uh, country, thanks to a dense railway network. And the first railway line was created in 1830. It was a railway between Liverpool and Manchester. In other words, it was a railway between a city with many factories, Manchester, and a harbour, Liverpool. So that was pretty logical from an economic point of view. In my lesson, you can find a, a quote by uh, a novelist, uh, who I, I had never heard of, but I think his quote is, is, is really meaningful and clear. He described the world he, he could see uh, with the, the train, and he says, The pre-industrial world has passed into limbo and vanished. They have raised r those railway embankments up and shut off the old world that was behind them. It is gone. So yes, uh, even the people that lived this period could... Uh, feel that things were changing so much that you could say that one world was dead and a new world was born. And because our perspective is a comparison between Britain and France, it's very important to say a few words about how uneven was the pace of industrialization. So we are, we are speaking of a um, a change, a series of change that progressively turned an industrial sector which was based on what we call the domestic system, which is that most people that were actually producing goods were, were working at home or in very, very small factories that we would call workshops uh, that were located in city centers and that were often, yes, in, in the home of the boss. So, for example, here you can see an individual weaver. He is rich enough to have a very advanced machine for the 18th century, but he's working alone because, anyway, he is using his own energy with his foot to uh, activate his uh, weaving machine. 
Now, the creation of the steam engine and more generally the creation of new ways to produce energy uh, progressively led to the development of factories a factory being basically a very big workshop in, where in which you can have many workers working together on the same production process and the reason why the reason why it becomes economically interesting and profitable to gather these workers together to concentrate them in the same place is the fact that what is now important is that you have a big machine and you need the workers to move to this big machine and you can't have any more small machines scattered in the villages okay here we have a very strong link between industrialization and urbanization because workers now were told by the managers, by the capitalists, to get together and live in big cities because this is where the jobs were. It changed a lot of things. Uh, working in the manufacturing sector before the 19th century mostly meant that you were to a certain extent an independent worker. Of course you worked in collaboration with other uh, people and people were not not free uh, to, to produce uh, absolutely everything they wanted. They had to work for somebody already but at least they worked at home, they worked at the individual level. Now workers were working together as teams and some of these teams could be massive and it changed a lot of things culturally because some people had to migrate some people had to learn new languages some people shared the same living conditions and this is how really the emergence of a working class characterized by the same living conditions and often the same ideas was made possible so huge political consequences as well uh, you can see on this slide uh, another example of a, a factory now seen from above and this one is in France because France was not totally uh, uh, out of the game um, many factories were next to rivers because uh, the energy of the water and also the the river used as uh, a way to evacuate rubbish could be uh, very useful it could be useful for transport as well you can see here really a pattern of you uh, a factory located next to a river because there is an interest to locate this here all this uh, structure is next to a big castle uh, with the probably the, the the capitalist family owning the factory and progressively you need to you need to accommodate the workers as well so it creates a little city that's basically the principle how uh, a big city uh, or at least a new industrial city could be created anyway by the 1830s britain had become really the factory of the world i mean what we say what we say about china today uh, had to be said about Britain um, 150 years ago there was a huge economic growth Britain was producing massively and so exporting its manufactured goods all over the world via via ports like Liverpool or London the industrial north was uh, really the 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 area of uh, of this production and as you can see on this graph, uh, Britain was more advanced than any other countries. France and Germany were um, in, in a competition for trying to uh, catch up with Britain, but throughout the 19th century, the advance of Britain uh, was uh, unchallenged, actually. So here is the, the map of, uh, of Liverpool that I wanted to show you. Uh, the port of Liverpool 
uh, had a hinterland. We saw that uh, definition together in geography. A hinterland uh, in the country consisting of uh, the, the, the main productive areas and cities in the world, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield or Birmingham. And uh, it's it, the reason why Liverpool was the, the thrivest uh, and busiest port in the world at that moment. Britain used to export most of its, uh, uh, not most, but to export a lot of its manufactured production, and it had to import things as well. In fact, what is remarkable is that Britain quickly gave up on farming and uh, started to import a lot of crops, a lot of food, but uh, more generally it imported uh, things that it did not have, uh, tea from India obviously, but also uh, wheat and, uh, all the and, and some raw material like cotton that was needed for the textile factories as well. Geographically speaking, the spreading of industrialization was uh, quite uneven in Europe. This map is really from the ending of uh, uh, the period of this lesson, the 1870s. And you can see that uh, in Britain, th the majority of the, uh, of the island consisted in areas that were actually industrialized. But in most of the other countries, uh, with the exception of Belgium maybe, vast part of the territories remained pretty rural and uh, industrialization was concentrated only in small areas. Look at France for example. You had industrial areas in the north, in the region of Lyon, in the city in Paris and only a, a couple of spots on the territory and that was all. So you can see on this map the clear contrast. Britain was mostly urban and industrial France was still mostly rural, a much wider country by the way, with some small areas uh, of modern industry. And when we, when we talk about modern industry, you must think that with the modern industry also came the modern uh, service sector, because finance was needed. The big companies, big factories needed finance for, for starting and then working. They needed banks. They needed insurance. Uh, the, the banks and the insurance companies were necessary to provide investors with capital, with the means of production. And uh, so even on that sector, Britain was very advanced and was considered not only the factory of the world, but also the bank of the world. And, uh, well, the, um, to say a bit more about the, the spreading of industrialization now in France, uh, we, we tend to, to say that France was mostly divided along, s along a line, in a diagonal stretching from Le Havre to Marseille, and that north of this diagonal you had the most uh, industrial France, and uh, the most rural France south of this line. Anyway, uh, the political system in France at the middle of the 19th century, the system and the regime of Napoleon III, uh, was rather a pro-business uh, regime and a pro-business government. Uh, Napoleon III really believed in the necessity of modernizing the French economy and uh, to help businessmen to, to develop. New banks were created. There are, you can see the name of these banks in, um, in, in my lesson. Well. What is absolutely impressive and very important for you to observe is the spreading of the railway network. Britain was the first country to be very densely covered by a network of railways and it really changed uh, the world, but it started in Britain. Ireland was covered much later than, than Britain, even though, well, if we consider uh, the whole history of, uh, of mankind, uh, this all happened more or less at the same period. But that was pretty fast and that was pretty dense. The contrast with France 
is uh, very interesting and very clear because you can see that France was well also eventually covered by a rather dense netway, uh, network of railway but that at the middle of the 19th century while Britain was already almost totally covered in France uh, it was mostly the northern part of the country around Paris that was beginning to look like a network actually uh, by the way uh, at the end of the of the 19th century the railway network was at its peak in both countries it is much less much less dense nowadays because uh, most of us use the car more than the railway so there is less there are less trains obviously today uh, and so with this comparison of two unevenly fast development of railways where well, you have a good illustration of the uh, two paces of industrialization in Britain and in France in any case this uh, this contrast uh, nevertheless permitted a trade agreement signed between the government of France and the government of Britain. Uh, for some reason, on the English-speaking Wikipedia page, I found that this treaty was named after the ministers of economy that signed it, so it's known as the Corben Chevalier Treaty. But on this uh, drawing illustrating the treaty you can of course see Queen Victoria and Emperor Napoleon III uh, that's a pretty simple and, and nice drawing by the way and you can see also the flags of both countries and the slogan in France la réciprocité la base vraie et durable de la paix where you can see that the uh, behind this trade agreement you add also the the political objective to to be at peace uh, you must remember that uh, in the napoleon the first era well war between britain and france had been really really uh, harsh the goal of this treaty of 1860 was to boost french exports and for napoleon the third you need to to compel the french industry to be more competitive in front of british imports of course that was pretty harsh a competition that uh, uh, led to some difficulties in the first place for France but Napoleon III well largely believed that yes a, a real competition with the British would be a good reason for the French industrialists to, uh, to, to become more efficient and so tariffs were reduced a tariff is a tax that is being paid on imports uh, the level of uh, of tariff was still high if we compare it to, to nowadays but anyway it put an end to a long tradition of protectionist policy uh, in France and um, and the, the result of that was mostly that um, in fact France could export more crops to Britain so perhaps in fact, the, the, the real effect of this treaty was also to, um, to, to, ins to keep on developing a strong farming industry in France. Uh, and maybe it uh, eventually slowed down the, the shift from a, a, a rural to an urban country for France. Anyway, by 1870, both countries had known a strong period of prosperity. Britain remained far above. But uh, at the world scale, uh, France and Britain, alongside Germany in the USA, had really um, obtained an economic advance, creating a real gap uh, between them and the rest of the world that uh, would um, keep on developing for the next decades and um, really form a, a pattern for by which Europe and more generally the West Europe plus North America could dominate the rest of the world.